Zambia Numo Raising Babies 101 Ribua Gayo estimated due date. It comes and goes. Do you decide what day your baby will be born or wait? At what age is it safe to give your baby an anima kapo spate? And the big question, you want to get pregnant, how do you choose the best medical cover? It's all coming up, more Raising Babies 101. around us are scheduled to time. When it comes to being an expectant mom, it's all about time and counting down the months, matzati, and then the hours and the minutes. Due dates, their accuracy, and why they are important. Obstetrician and gynecologist, Dr. Andre van der Westhuizen is here to help us understand this. Welcome, Doctor. Carol, thank you for having me. Great, so due dates, why are they so important? Gosh, I mean, there's so many things that that there's nine months, mm. okay, and the due date will determine exactly where you are during the pregnancy. There's so many things that need to happen during the nine months. There's so many investigations you need to have. There's so many things that needs to be planned. Mm. So for that reason, I mean, the due date is essentially with what we use to determine where exactly you are. Mm. Um, and that's what the importance of establishing exactly the, due, the correct due date, let mm. me say that, right from the very beginning, mm -hmm. try and establish the most correct date so yes. that we can plan the nine months ahead and um, and see when what needs to happen. When should an expectant mom start to get sweaty palms? Well, depending on what it, well, I think they all do, right from the very beginning. <laughs> I don't know if it happens right at the end. My patients tell me they get nervous at 36 weeks, but yes. uh, I think they're nervous right from the beginning. Yes. Um, it all depends on, you know, what you've got planned. Yes. I don't think it is as real as in the third trimester. Mm. I think then it becomes really real. And I think the delivery is what scares them the most, um, especially the first ones. And how accurate when you go to see your gynae? Is your, is your due date when they tell you? So I think the most important thing is for us to understand is the majority of women actually don't know their cycle that well, okay? Mm. We tend to think we do, and, um, but they don't. All right, I think women today, especially career women, they're busy and they forget. I mean, the majority of my patients have apps and that's very cool. Mm. But, it, you know, I don't know how many women have apps on their phones, but to, they track their periods. Yes. But essentially, um, that is you know, the most important thing is mm -hmm. to try and establish when your first day of your last normal period was. So essentially 37 completed weeks of gestation is a term pregnancy. Okay. Okay, and um, depending on that, you know, I would say 37 completed weeks up to 42 weeks. Okay. Anything in between there is more or less term. Oh, okay. it is term. It's not more or less term. It okay. is term. Um, there's risk associated with where you are exactly during that time. Where are All the right. risks? Can you walk so, us through? So what happens is, and I think that's the most important thing to understand, is at about 36 weeks, the placenta kind of matures. All right. Ooh. And what happens is the placental function slowly starts decreasing. And that is the most important thing when it comes to post-term pregnancies and all those things that concern us as doctors. Oh. Um, so that is a natural process that happens, all right? And you always need to keep that in mind. And that's where the complications arise. So in essence, what you're saying is the placenta has its own due date. <laughs> kind of, kind of, if yeah. you want to see it like that. Yes. Absolutely. Um, it is kind of normal. So don't get a fright when you reach 36 weeks and now your placental function decreases. I mean, mm -hmm. it happens. Mm -hmm. It's a normal phenomenon. However, the implications on a pregnancy could be disastrous if it's not managed correctly. And what I mean by that is, for instance, your stillbirth rate goes up after if you progress a pregnancy after 42 weeks, that type of stuff. So that is what you need to keep in mind when you look at the management of of a pregnancy that would go over expected due date. So when we start round about that um, full term range, 37, 38 weeks, up to 40 weeks, I know a lot of the time what, what, what um, moms and, 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 and people will tell you is always make sure the baby is moving. At some day, in the, in, you know, some time in the day, you must have some sort of movement in your baby. Is that a myth or is no, it? No, not at all, not at all. Um, so I, you know, fetal movements are probably the most easiest and a very reliable method mm. of determining how well the baby is doing. I mean, mm. we have all these nice tests that we can do, ultrasounds, mm. Dopplers, biophysical profiles and all these type of things. Mm. However, for women out there on a daily basis, I mean, you don't go to the gynae every day. And unfortunately, 
you know, in a rural setup, um, we don't have those services readily available. Oh. So the fetal movements are probably the most reliable method for these type of patients and for any patient for that matter to oh. to to check on fetal well-being. Oh. So we kind of use as a ballpark figure, I would say 10 movements a day okay. um, to keep an to, to make sure your baby is healthy. You okay. know, the, the, it is not always that easy. I would often say this to my patients, they all phone me and baby moved eight times a day. You yes. know, but women are busy. <laughs> I mean, today's women are they busy. Yes. So they can't just sit and count movements, but yes. I would say a ballpark figure 10 or at least one every four hours. So what is your final advice to our expectant moms watching at home on this issue of due dates? Well, I have a lot to say to them. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the most important message that I would like to leave with them is when you're considering falling pregnant, yes. you know, the first day of your last normal period is, is important. So kind of have like a sort of a diary or something where you write down when you start bleeding so that you always remember that date because that date will be very, very important. To come back to the post-term concept of when a patient would be posted. The majority of these cases are just wrong dates. Mm -hmm. So that's how important it is to actually remember that date. Mm -hmm. Because in the majority of cases, there's not something serious happening. Yes. It's actually just because the dates were wrong. Wrong. Oh, simple, yeah. simple, simple, simple. Absolutely, it's back to <laughs> basics. That's what it's all about. Back to basics. <laughs> Thank you so much, Doctor, for that insight. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you, Carol. So now remember, you have to remember the first day of your last period. That will help doctors estimate your due date much better. Now that we appreciate time a little better, it's time for You Decide. Today on You Decide, do you believe that Mwana Okana Omufa Enema Kapospeiti? Studio audience, please vote now. The majority thinks yes. Well, that's very interesting. We hit the streets to see what you had to say. I don't get uh, illogic here because I'm going to be Because if you have a fever or something wrong, you should just take the child to the doctor. An animal is not health for a child because for my son's age, I think it will probably maybe be harmful to his health. Because it's not medically proven, so I won't give it to my baby. Today we question whether enemas or spade are actually safe to use on a baby. I'm joined by sister Frida Makanete, who works with the Cosmo City community and helps mothers in their first days at home with baby. Dumela sister legai. Okay, king enema kapo spade king yon So spade ki it's some device that people would use to to th they'll put in water with some chemicals. It could be soap or other uh, chemicals that I, I really don't know what mm. do they put in there. But it's used to it's put in the anus and used to clean out the system. They mm. say, usually in constipated babies mm. most of the time. Mm. Yes. So speaking about your neck constipation, can it cause some constipation, mobane? Okay, constipation can be caused by uh, the baby's diet. Uh, some babies, when they are fed on, uh, when we talk about babies, newborn babies, fed on solids. Babies are supposed to be fed on milk. Mm. So when babies are then introduced early on solids, they usually then become constipated. Some babies do become uh, constipated while using uh, even milk. It depends on the baby's system. So, sister, when should Mutwadi Abereki send to for one high? If yes or no, or. Medically, uh, as for me, the Rwanda curry, he paid Tabana, the Emir Unandelo, Nakuri, Ungati, Ungati Chunch, especially if it's constipation. Mm. The body can actually uh, release it itself and clean itself. We, we don't necessarily have to be using uh, 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 the enemas. Okay. It's, medically, it's just not, it's not a way of, of solving. So are you saying Horadirotena had the safety, the 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 They are not the safe. Enema. They're not safe because should you then uh, be constantly helping the body mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to relieve constipation or to clean mm -hmm. itself, it then gets to a point where it just stops and it mm -hmm. just relies on constipation. Whereas when you, you eat right, 
when you 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 just let your body drink mm. a lot of water, mm. it can actually help the body clean itself mm. out. So, when I was told about living on the ground, the baby got the enema. The two sa the immune system grow. When I add the or when I have a stronger, better immune system, it will bring it away. Uh, like I've said, the body has its way. You know, your your body has its way of doing things uh, that we think maybe it needs help on. Mm. Um, should we 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 come to nutrition? You know, once you 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 develop a good nutrition for your babies uh, from a very early age, uh, Carol, in your house, if you teach teach them to eat fruit and. You must know, as a mother, you have to be eating the things that you want your baby to be eating. True. Yes. Once, I mean, if you if you if you make that uh, a norm in your house to eat fruit, to to have more water, maybe have competition on that. I mean, that will actually <laughs> be... water competitions. Yes. Hari Utrache, we've got a question in the audience. Dumela me. Dumela, okay. Achele kai. Kiteng Luisa laka kina leji. Eh, na leji. Na nekwa tla wata kuri does feeding a baby formula instead of breast milk cause constipation? That's a very good question because uh, uh, breastfeeding stands to be platinum standard mm -hmm. and uh, mixed feeding is not uh, encouraged at all. So once you mix feed your baby, you are tempering with the baby's immune system. But once your baby is six months and older, then you are, it, it, it needs some like solids, but not formula so the reason for not feeding formula it's because of the nutri the, the nutrients mm. in the in the breast milk are best more than your mm. formula thank you mera le bo khafana ko ya ga go le go tlhalosa gore the the enemas or the baby they are actually not advisable mm. and you are actually tempering limile wa ngwana ha we berekis we really appreciate your time thanks for having me so, Luke, we are here. Healthcare providers, but no, let's carry the rest of the pay to move on. And I'm sure when I'm going to have a show, we'll be on TV. We're going to have no, but yes, but it's looking like I'm too tired. So, thank you once again. There you have the information. Now it's for you to decide. Luckily, you can search "Raising Babies 101" on social media platforms. Follow us, like us, have your conversation, have your comments. We want to hear from you. For now, though, it's time for us to take a quick break. One of the most intimidating times for parents is potty training. After the break, we have Sister Frida to help us navigate potty issues. <laughs> Raising Babies 101. Many parents spend many sleepless nights worrying about potty training. When is the right time to start? How does one even start? Sister Frida is here to show us how to best do it and how to win the battle of potty training. It is easy peasy. <laughs> Welcome back, Sister Frida. So, Kupan Kalu said, so when does a parent start potty training one hour high? Okay, when it comes to age, there's no magical age mm. to start that. Uh, usually, one hour will give you signs. The signs get off. So, when you talk about signs of potty training, mm. uh, they wake up with a dry nappy. Mm. They usually uh, indicate to you that they're uncomfortable in that wet nappy or, or soiled nappy. Or they even maybe an ali corner or now where they do their number two, then mm -hmm. you start noticing. Hore, okay, now we are actually noticing. Hore, something is happening. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So na kina lengwa na om shiman. Is there a difference between potty training from one om shimani lengwa na wanyan? Ah, it is mm. for me. It is uh, because uh, your boy usually have a ruta. Ba ruta skabunta te ba ema. Ba ema. Yes. Yano ngbato ema aruta kamunto eso. I never ask thing like okay. everywhere. So there's different types of your 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 potty. Eh. Okay. And I know there's very little ones, but a little higher. Mm. Okay. And there's so so I guess if it's a boy, you'll want to get something a bit higher. Mm -hmm. And there's one that covers the seat, the toilet seat. Uh -huh. So it will be on the toilet seat. Mm. Then it covers just to uh, reduce diameter ya yeah, toilet. Mm. Because then they need to be on the on the higher level. Okay. Right level. So kopar thalo setsa kore. What do we do? Ha, re mo for the first time. Oh, okay. Sa the body. 
usually the first time I see uh, it's not really new, ne? Mm -hmm. I see mm -hmm. because you have to show them that routine okay, to show okay, them so them okay, this is what's happening. Okay, okay so that like, what is have, this? Mm -hmm. Because one, one, one thing that they do, they'll be lifting this thing up eh, ne? Eh, around. <laughs> That's what 18 year olds and two year olds do. So, 18 month old, you mean? Yeah, yeah even if it's a, it's, a, it's a two year old. So I don't want to really uh, be on that age because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 18 months, it's like a little or only two years. Tammy Ribone Cabana Baruna, or what's a major? Risca, but we shouldn't push them into it. Mm. Let's let our babies show mm. us, give us the signs, and then Rizale Libona because we need to give them confidence in doing this and let them do something they're comfortable. Okay, with. show us. Rizal. So, should there be, let's say it's a baby girl, mm. okay, with a baby girl. So a sitting baby, being a girl or boy, in terms of um, having to sit on the potty, they have to be grounded, mm. OK? So if you're going to be using a potty, a toilet seat, about mm. having reduced the diameter, that little seat on top, mm. you need a step. Mm. So the baby must be on the stepper so that the baby feels safe, mm. grounded and more confident. Because when we ground it, we are confident and mm. we know that we are safe to actually do this. Mm. So the baby's feet have, have to be on the floor, mm. whether it's that step or it's the, pot, it's, it's the floor. Okay. okay. And then another thing, we have to be with our kids every time they, they do this. Mm. We don't have to leave them alone because mm. they still need the support. Yeah. This is something very new. And then there's a reward system that you can do as well. Put some stars every time they do it right. Mm. And even if they didn't do it right, I mean, you just have to always cheer, mm. cheer them on. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, always uh, you have to teach them hygiene as well. Mm. Yes. But the positioning, most important, they have to be grounded. Mm -hmm. Mm. You know, especially the how Mushimanyana we're young. We tell her. So with the boys, mm -hmm. obviously the boys will be standing with when they urinating. Yeah. So this has to be done with the father figure or the the man in the house. If there's no dad, it's still fine. Mm. Although they'll be following how mummies will be peeing, because most women we just sit when mm. we pee. So they will follow that. But as time goes on, they will be realizing that because we are boys, mm. this is how it's done. And then support it for them. Put it like that so mm -hmm. that they can be more comfortable and, and uh, confident to actually. And mistakes, we mustn't be hard, Mobon. Not at all. Not yeah. at all. Mistakes always happen. And another thing that we need to, 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 to remember, Carol, mm. what we dress them mm. have to be easy for them to pull up and mm. to pull down mm -hmm. without a hustle. Yeah. You can imagine if these pants are tight, there's this elastic that's tight, mm. and now little Johnny's running there, trying mm. to, you yeah, know, to pull and like, I want my star, <laughs> you know? And then as I they mean. get there, an accident happens, happens. all, all yeah, because of that. Yeah. So then they become uh, a little bit discouraged. So we need to put clothes that are actually, uh, that support the potty training as Okay. Well. Yeah. What I've also noticed, Libana Babanyani, is that sometimes, but like, I made a poop, I made a poop, how check a lady, how na sepe. Is that a sign that maybe we send one could toilet thing, he might want to go? It could be a sign. And mm. remember, you will be uh, learning a routine. Mm. You are getting to know this child yeah. in that stage as well. Mm. Okay, yeah. so you, you're getting to know that your, your child in that stage. So you need to follow and believe. Every time they say, poo 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 poo, you need to follow and just check. Some, some parents, they still keep the nephew on because now they think uh, maybe let's just leave the nephew yeah. on up until they are more confident that the baby yeah. can, so just to avoid the, the accidents. But if it's not there, support your baby and put your baby on the poo, mm. on, on, the, on the seat on to the actually seat. Uh, encourage that poo to What's come What's your out. final words, uh, advice for Batari Kuhai? I would say uh, parents shouldn't be hard on their kids. Mm. We, we often hard, yeah. yeah. You just have to take it easy, believe in your baby. Uh, it gives them confidence mm. and more than being hard and shouting, you actually need to be clapping with each and every mistake so that babies learn that we learn by mistake. Yeah, you encourage them. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Frida. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. It's time for our baby shower giveaway. <laughs> Okay, Mubuhedi, as you have seen, Huhudi Sabana can be a very, very costly affair. To make life a little easier for you, segment Ena, Ya Baby Shower, Gihuhutusa, that's on Edimpo. This week, we have a baby hamper voucher to give away. All you need to do is answer yes or no to one very simple question correctly. Can breech births be dangerous? 
to enter this competition, Khubunolo, where now Setwane Tse Osiete ke go answer this question, yes or no, most social media platforms. Answer correctly, and one lucky viewer will randomly be selected to win a baby hamper voucher valued at 1,000 Rand. The winner will be announced on our social media. Best of luck. Sisila Talang on Raising Babies 101. In Babies Health A to Z, we unpack the letter B for breech birth and talk choosing medical insurance options when expecting. So, Lifeta Hunyala and you want to get pregnant, it's exciting and nerve-wracking. Then you realize that you need to change your healthcare plan because now there's more than just the two of you. This is the big question. <laughs> Well, Sam, to help you sitting with me in studio is Chantal Howe, a financial advisor, to chat about this further. Welcome, Chantal. Thank you. So talk to us about um, medical plans uh, specifically for you uh, when you decide that you're going to fall pregnant. What would you say is the first steps? Well, uh, before you fall pregnant, make sure you have good health care cover. Mm -hmm. So I would do a lot of investigation, see if you want a plan that's salary-based. Yes. Depending on income, we, um, in the industry, you can get anything from a salary of 3000 mm -hmm. up to it's open-ended. But make sure you have medical cover before you fall pregnant. Okay. okay. Now, there's a real, uh, you know, r reason why people kind of shy away from medical cover because it's seen as expensive and unafford unaffordable for most. It used to be, yes, but now they're structuring medical aids to suit the needs of the people. So mm. they're salary-based now, so anything from naught to 8,000 and up. Mm. So whether they look at your salary, your income, what your expenses on, and they base the medical cover on that cost. And what happens if you're unemployed? Well, if people are supporting you, mm. you can still take medical aid. I've got mm. quite a few clients who are housewives, um, mm. are pregnant mothers who can't work, the family support them and they cover the cost of the medical aid and then we base their salary on zero. Mm. So then you can start anywhere from 300 and up. So uh, can you uh, join a, a medical aid company when you are already pregnant? I would advise against that yes. unless you're joining a big group because they will do underwriting which means they check your medical history. If you are pregnant they will exclude that pregnancy for the term. So let's say for an example you're three months pregnant to join the medical aid. Mm. They will then put an exclusion in for six months until the baby's born. Oh, I see. If you, heaven forbid, have a miscarriage before that, mm. then the next pregnancy is not excluded because you're already on the medical aid. They don't exclude that particular pregnancy. Okay. Mm. So how important is it for an expectant mother to, to investigate or have uh, medical aid? Well, I think it is. You know, not just the birth. The birth can cost anywhere from, say, 15000 and up if you're going private. Mm. But if that baby gets sick and it has mm. to go into neonatal, that goes into the millions. So you need to make sure that you have the cover that will look after that baby. So mm. I do think it's important. And you also get the best medical technology for that baby in mm. that situation. There are lots of moms watching now who've had babies in, in, in you know, public hospitals and everything's gone seemingly well. What yeah. would you say to a mom saying, listen, my aunt did it, my cousin's did it, done it, why well, must I, I get it, medical yeah. aid? Yeah. Well, it, you know, it happens. Um, I can give you lots of variations where mothers are planning it and they plan their day and they're going to early labour and the baby's mm. fine and, they have the, and everything's perfect. Then there's another one where the pregnancy is fine, they go into labour and the children are, are sick or they need a heart condition, things that they couldn't pick up prior to the birth. Mm. So in terms of that, I would say private health care is important. Mm. But if you have to go government, then, you know, those are your choices you have. So private health care, let's talk about it. What are you looking for if you decide I'm going to get myself medical aid? Because I know there's a lot of clauses and things that can mm. lose you and you end up when you need the medical aid to kick in, you don't get what you actually want or need. My, the first thing you need to make sure is that you have comprehensive hospital cover. Mm. Medical aid covers in-hospital treatment right through to dentists, optometrists and things like that. Being pregnant, you don't necessarily need those extra benefits in hospitals where you need the cover. Mm. Doctors and hospitals generally charge medical aid tariff, but those costs can run up very high. Let's say you go in for a natural birth and you end up having a Caesar. Mm. That's already putting up the cost then the baby's prem and has to go into neonatal. So your hospital fees are the most expensive fees you can experience. Mm. Out of hospital is where you can manage those. Speaking about hospital fees, what if I decide that I don't have medical cover, but I would like to give birth in a, a private hospital? Is it quite expensive to no, do so? Put down a 20,000 rand deposit before they'll even admit you. Wow. Yeah. So before they even admit you, 20,000 rand. You'll be in labor in the waiting room and they'll have one 20,000 rand. Wow. 
before. So, yes. so, so what else would you say, uh, you know, expectant parents or people planning to have a baby should look out for if they are planning to go with uh, medical aid? Make sure you have access to a private health care. Look, there are plans that have access to the private size of government hospitals, mm. which I think is a great initiative. So make sure that the hospital cover you've got is not limited mm. and that it covers the hospital that you would choose. Say you're choosing um, Donald Gordon. Mm. Make sure that that hospital is available to you on that plan. Donald Gordon is available on most plans, but if you want to go more private, say Santon Clinic, make sure your plan is available on that hospital plan. Other plans restrict you to certain hospitals where that affects cost again. Mm. So if you choose that plan, then you'll be restricted to those, those hospitals. Mm -hmm. But make sure that your plan is recognised by the medical aid. Mm. Avoid medical insurance because mm. that's not a medical aid. That only covers you from day four and like the little clauses. Mm. But medical aid, they will cover you from the minute you're admitted to the hospital. So let's say I'm already pregnant and I want to, you know, add things to it. For example, when I uh, was pregnant, we, we looked at gap cover because there were a couple of things that were like not paid for by the medical aid. What are some of the extras you can add to make sure if you have the extra finances to do so? Okay, well, medical aid, your, your foundation would be your hospital plan. Mm -hmm. So that's the most important part. Yes. Then you can start building onto it. So let's say now you have a limited savings account mm. and that you can use for doctors, pediatrician, scans and things. Once that money's run out, then you're responsible for the rest. Mm. Then you have other plans where you can have comprehensive colour, which is all the, the bells and whistles. So you'll go through your savings and then you'll have a, a small gap that you have to pay and then they give you unlimited cover and above that. But mm -hmm. those get very expensive. Beyond medical cover, what other plans should a parent think about when wanting to have a child? I would say it's very important to have life insurance. Mm -hmm. um, if something should happen to either the mom or dad, the costs of education and medical, I mean schooling alone is higher than inflation. Mm. So you need to make sure that you have some form of cover in place that that child's looked after and is able to go further and study in his life. Is life insurance expensive? It can be. Life insurance on its own, no, it's mm. not expensive. It's the severe illness cover, the disability covers. But if you speak to your financial advisor, they, they are, they take your income, obviously has to be very important into consideration. And they, the structure around your financial and your, your other needs. Mm. So I do think life cover is very important. As you get older, you need to add severe illness and disability because cancer is prevalent. Mm. So let's say you get diagnosed with breast cancer mm. and you now can't work, you can't support your child, the severe illness benefit will pay out and allows you to then look after your family from there. I see. We have a question from our studio audience. Let's hear. Okay, what if, ne, Sis Carol, mm. we are harmed but we are spared lele, we private hospital, then it pay medical aid yako. While you are unconscious, we are cool. Mm. Why, like, by a guazo, about to mela, we public hospital. So, are you going to lela, but no, yenza, then, to mela, when you are public hospital. Okay. I think the just of a question is, what happens if you have your private medical aid but it runs out? Is it possible for private medical aid to run out? Day-to-day -day benefits, yes. In hospital, no. Okay. No. That's so why you have to be very careful when you're buying medical insurance versus medical aid. Mm -hmm. Most medical aids now are unlimited. What's the difference between medical aid and medical insurance? Medical aid is controlled by the Council of Medical Schemes. Mm -hmm. So we are, they are structured according to the needs of the people and okay. we, we follow very important rules and regulations mm -hmm. and it's community based. So we look at the average age. So if you're 80 or you're 16, we all pay the same. There are things called late joining penalties that if you only join a medical aid after the age of 35, they can add late journal penalties. That you must be very careful of because a lot of people don't go into medical aid and as they get older, they get sicker and then they take medical aid and then they're paying double what they would have paid had they chosen to take one out earlier. Mm. But a hospital plan as such should not run out. Your day-to-day -day benefits, you need to manage those. And then medical insurance? Medical insurance, they can exclude anything and most times they put a 12-month exclusion on pregnancy. They don't cover miscarriages. They only cover you from day four. Babies are born in three days. So there are a lot of things. You need to look at the fine print. But if you want to be on a medical aid going further in life mm. and you stay on your medical insurance until age, after age 35, mm. we will not recognise that as being on medical aid. Mm. And what about educational planning? We spoke about life insurance. What about education? Very important. I would say the day you find out you're pregnant, you should start looking to invest or save money. There are different avenues. You can get educational policies and things like that. The only problem with some of those are that they restrict you mm. and you can only use those for education. Mm -hmm. So my advice would be to either put it into a flexible investment that you can draw on, but more importantly, put it into a fund 
you cannot touch for the first five years. Mm -hmm. So that will be an endowment fund. So most children will start preschool or grade R at age five. The funds will then be released to you and you can choose whether to use that for schooling or something else. Mm -hmm. Maybe your financial position's changed and you don't need that money, you can reinvest it. If you buy an educational policy, some of them restrict you and say, well, we need an invoice for the school, we need an invoice for textbooks, we need an invoice for this, and they're only paid accordingly. You don't want people to tell you what to do with your money at the end of the day. Thank you so much, Chantal. Really it's appreciate it. So there you have it, Sam. You have your answer, thanks to Chantal. Continue with our conversation by searching Raising Babies 101 on all social media platforms. For now, a quick break. Stay with us. Cecilia Delau, what is a breech birth and how does it affect your baby? In Baby A to Z, we find out. And a celebrity parent. <laughs> Raising Babies 101. Our letter for Babies Health A to Z is B for breech birth. A breech birth occurs when a baby is born bottom first instead of head first. Dr. Andre van der Westeisen is an obstetrician and gynecologist and is back to talk to us about this topic. Dr. Andre, what is a breech birth and how does it occur? Okay, so, I mean, you just gave the definition, so mm. you did pretty well on that. I'm not <laughs> going to repeat that. I, I think um, we need to establish this first. There's always a cause, okay? And in about a small percentage, I'm not going to bore you with statistics, um, we can't find a cause for it, okay? So the main thing is to find out why that baby didn't turn, because the normal way of a baby being born is head first. Mm. So there's normally a reason. Okay. What are some of the reasons? Oh, you know, growths inside your uterus, like fibroids. I mean, there's so many things, oh. like a lot of fluid, decreased fluid. There's so many things. Mm. Mm. Um, I, an abnormal baby, I mean, there's really a lot of them, so I'm mm. not going to bore you. Mm. I, I, that's what I'm saying. When that occurs, in the majority of cases, a course should be found. Mm. You should be able to visit some form of clinic or a doctor of sorts to establish why your baby is not delivering head first. Can a, can a mother tell if her baby I, is breech? I'm not too sure if I would say yes, because if she has some medical knowledge, possibly, okay, if she, if she understands how babies, where they kick and how they lie, and if she knows what she's feeling, mm. um, I'm not too sure how educated all moms are. I see what you're saying. Um, but you are a medical professional of sorts, a midwife, would definitely be able to tell. They can, we can feel it. So when should the baby start turning? So babies turn and move around all the time. Okay. okay. And I get this often from my patients because I would get a baby, a, a patient at 32 weeks and it's all of a sudden a breach again. You know, babies do turn. And it doesn't mean when your baby is at a specific time, early in pregnancy especially, a, a breach doesn't mean that the baby will be breached. Mm. The majority of babies do turn. Mm. I get kind of concerned if I would say at about 36 weeks, if the baby, maybe a little slightly earlier actually, mm. but if the baby hasn't turned yet. What's the worst case scenario? Worst case scenario, you see, now that becomes a bit complicated because mm. we know that a mm. breech baby should probably, not probably, should not deliver vaginally. Mm. Okay, there are so many risks and complications and we do know from good evidence that breech deliveries don't do well. Okay. Um, but unfortunately, it's not always that easy to establish that beforehand some moms present in labor and it's a breach and there's no Caesar available or theater available and it has to be delivered that way. Mm. And, and then you need to cope. Then you need to know what you're doing. And for those type of scenarios, that's why it's so important not to deliver at home. Because mm. when you have these type of things, this is a medical emergency. I mean, this is where some experienced midwife or doctor should deliver your baby and know mm. what they're doing. Mm. That's, that's how important it is. How dangerous is it for, for mom as well as baby when the baby's I, I don't want to necessarily downplay the effects on mom, okay? Mm -hmm. But the majority of cases, the effects will be quite severe on the baby, all right? Like? Um, oh, birth injuries, trauma, the head can get stuck. Remember, the head is the biggest part, essentially, or the head can't be squeezed together. Mm. So once the head is out, everything will follow, mm. okay? That's the basic principle of the thing. Mm. If the body comes out first, the head is the biggest part. So. Sure. The, the head can get stuck, mm. and that's when babies die and they 
you know, they have birth asphyxia, which is oxygen shortages mm. and that type of thing. And that is a disaster to an obstetrician. I mean, that type of stuff should be avoided. I've heard that uh, you can sort of tap a baby in a certain way and help them sort of move <laughs> along to the right position. I'm having a little can bit I... of a cough <laughs> there. Um, yes, we do turn them, okay? Oh. It, we can do that, all right? Of course, that is not something that I would want a patient to do on her own because okay. there's risks involved. Yes. So yet again, it should be done by an experienced person who knows what they're doing. We call it ECV, okay? Um, and it should be done by someone who can monitor you Mm. to make sure that you don't develop these complications. There's certain things that has to be available um, to handle these complications when that happens because any procedure, like any procedure in the medical field, has got risks. So when you do turn the baby, you know, certain things need to be taken care of. Um, and you need an experienced person to, to pick them up and, and handle them, manage them correctly. Mm. So your final thoughts on this topic? I think the most important thing is to at least seek some form early booking, okay? And that means before 20 weeks, mm -hmm. you need to f some form of clinic or doctor or you need to uh, approach some medical professional to check your pregnancy out. Mm -hmm. And at some point you need a checkup to make sure that everything is in order if you are planning on having a vaginal birth. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Andre, for giving us insight on what exactly a breech baby is and the importance of, if you're worried, seeing a medical doctor or someone who can help you with that. We'll be right back in a moment. Well, welcome back to Raising Babies 101. This is my favorite part of the show when I get to sit down with a yummy mommy or a dishy daddy. Well, today it's a dishy daddy and it's the singing sensation, Dr. Dumi. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Yes, welcome yeah. to Raising Babies. Raising Babies. It's a <laughs> life, lifelong responsibility. I know, and yeah. I hear her. I have three boys. Um, one is nine, become my son. Onalerana is four and Kumoitlile is 19 months. So wow. it's a full house. Boys. Boys. How does mommy feel with all the boys, Munchlu? She gets a lot of love. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think she's not complaining. Hey. Uh, there was a point she wanted to have a girl. Um, hey. uh, so yeah. is this in the pipeline? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Three is more than enough. Uh, um, but yeah, I think she's happy with boys. Yeah. Mm, mm. Yeah. Okay. Now, I know Hori are a very, very busy man and you've yeah. done some groundbreaking things, more, more South Africa. And yeah. to do that, Hunka Nako, and I'm sure it means a little bit of time away from family yeah. Akaho. How do you keep the connection, Libashima Nibahao, as yeah. well as your wife uh, being a, a person with such a big profile and so many fans to please? Yeah. Um, when I started off, it was, it, was, it was a bit easy to cope because the bookings were not so hectic. Um, uh, I was in private practice at that point um, and I was running three practices and um, starting off with a music career as well and it just got busier and busier and at some point I would I'd be away for a week or so um, um, and, and with the kind of work that I was doing, I'm at work all day um, and weekends I'm booked the whole weekend. It just got, got a bit hectic and I mm. started getting bookings. Uh, weekdays as well. So at some point I had to make a choice. What do I want to do? Uh, because it was um, starting to be a problem because mm -hmm. I'm away most of the time. I don't really get to see them. I come back home tired. Mm. Um, so I ended up having to decide to do one. And um, I, I still do practice, but in bits. Um, so for their sake, mm. I, I, I stopped um, being a full-time GP. What has been for when a highlight of being uh, a parent? Um, the little milestones, every, every phase of their growing. Uh, from the day they were born, I was there for all my kids um, um, when they were born. Um, um, and when they start walking, when they start talking, um, when they're naughty, you look back. Um, the other day, a few days ago, got back to the house. Um, I was tired, slept, it was during the day. When I woke up, my car alarm was off. And I find him standing, my four-year-old is on top of the car. He's washed the car. It's so dirty. 
And, you know, I was just thinking, this is so much love. He, he literally washed the whole car, even got on top of the car and washed the roof. And oh. even though he made it dirty, I actually understood that, you know what, it's out of love. He was, and, and when I walked in, he's like, Daddy, I washed the car. I'm like, oh, you did a good job. I was thinking, okay, <laughs> this car wash. really needs another <laughs> wash. Now, earlier on in the show, Rila Rabu woke up potty training. Yeah. Were you involved at all in the potty training of your boys? Um, no. Mm. <laughs> okay, I wasn't. Um, um, fortunately, when, we, when, when it was time to potty train them, they already uh, attending school, so they were potty trained at school. You do at home get a, a bit involved and remind them it's time to do this, you know? Mm. Um, but, um, yeah, I think they did that a lot at school, <laughs> more than at home. Um, so... Um, I, I, I do change diapers. Mm. Uh, uh, so. <laughs> Would you so. consider yourself a, a, a strict parent? No. Um, I think there are moments. Um, uh, you need to strike a balance again to, to not um, let them get away with what they shouldn't get away and not to be hard on them when they're just being kids. So it's a very thin, delicate line that you need to... Mm. strike some balance. What has been the biggest lesson that you've learned about being a dad? Love is a big thing mm. and kids can pick, uh, can, can pick it up when you are really loving towards them. Um, one of the things I, I do and I know traditionally um, in the olden days you, you don't really get to uh, hear fathers or men really expressing love especially to, to their sons. Yeah. I do that. I do that a lot. I affirm them. I say I love you to my kids as, as often as I get a moment. And they've picked, and it's easy for them to reciprocate and say I love you back, you know? Yeah. Um, so um, making it easy for them to love. And, um, and the other big lesson is for them to see you love their mom. Mm -hmm. Then you teach them how to trade, to, to love your wife and how to treat a lady and little things like that. There are so many lessons that you teach because they're watching each and every step of the way. Let's cross over to our studio audience. Uh, they would like to ask yeah. you a question. San Bonani. Hi. Hello. I'm a doctor to me. I'm a doctor to me. I'm a doctor to me. I'm a doctor to yeah. Like our office, like we have been numbered now in two thousand and zero. I have found a lot of people not You know, you know. <laughs> I always th when I think of girls, I always um, um, I judge myself by the fact that I'm a boy, right? And the feeling I get is I probably know better about boys than I know about girls. Yeah. I've always been scared of having baby girls for some reason, you know. Um, it feels like it's such a foreign territory for me. Of course, my wife would, would teach me how to treat a girl. Yes, of course. A baby girl. But, you know, I'm, I'm glad with boys. I, I won't lie. Uh, so the fact that I don't have a baby girl, uh, <laughs> my sons will bring girls to the house someday. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm cool with boys, and I think I'm better prepared to, to be a father to them. Obviously, when you have a baby girl, you... Um, kids are like that. You learn again. I probably would have learned, but I'm, I'm happy with boys. <laughs> <laughs> Some advice for our young fathers watching? Well, um, again, I think you, you need to prioritize your kids. You know, um, when, you're, when your kids say something, believe them. You know, give them that, um, that you believe in them. Um, I, I try by all means to encourage them to do well without really putting so much pressure on them because sometimes yeah. I think we become too hard. We try to fulfill our dreams through our kids. Mm. Um, one of the things I want to do, and I think this will make me happy at the end of the journey when they're all grown, is for me to help them become them and good at it. You know, um, offer them whatever support they need to find themselves, to find their gifts, to pursue what... It's within their heart. Uh, and if I do that well, um, and I teach them about God, uh, for me, those are two important things. Teach them to really have self-worth and teach them to know that there's God. That, for me, is vital in life. 
Alrighty. Thank yeah. you so much, Dr. Tumi, for coming in and sharing your parenting tips. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. <laughs> well, it is the end of our show, Gajenu, but we'll be back again next week. Ka Raising Babies 101. Remember, check us on social medias. But in the meantime, for me, Carol Ofori, till next week. Bye bye. Welcome to Pep Talk, your number one guide to everything related to parenting. Potty training can be stressful for both parents and toddlers. For parents, it's about figuring out when is the right time to start and how to do it, while children can never fully understand why their parents are rushing them. We've got a few tricks to help parents ace their potty training game. The internet is filled with advice on how you can potty train your child in a week or even a day. Some of these blogs might work, some might not. But what parents need to remember is to avoid rushing and embarrassing their children during the process. To get your toddler started, you need to observe their behavior and figure out if they are ready to start training. If your child makes a mistake, don't get angry. Simply try the training again a few weeks later. The second step to potty training your child is buying the right items to make the experience seamless for your child. You'll need nappies, underwear, choose fun colors and designs to get your child's buy-in through the process, and lastly, pants with elastic weights so your child won't need your help when going to the toilet. Once your child has mastered going to the toilet on their own, reinforce their pride by letting them give away their unused nappies to other kids. If you want to stand a chance to win some fantastic prizes with Pip, get onto our social media pages and enter our weekly competition. See you next time right here on Pip Talk, your number one guide to parenting.